Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. We are very sorry, but your wife has passed away, the doctor said and left the waiting room. No sympathy, no empathy, just an indifferent statement of fact. I guess not all doctors are like that. But on the other hand, what else can they say? We did everything we could. This phrase brings even more pain, it is better to say as dryly as this doctor. Paul got up from the comfortable soft chair and tiredly strode to the delivery room. His wife had been in labor for over six hours. The obstetrician had warned that there might be complications, and in the end Patricia didn't survive it. She lost too much blood. The man felt no grief, anger, or despair. After he saw the doctors running back and forth, saying something quickly to each other in a panic. He immediately understood everything, but he and Patricia had predicted this version of events. They were ready for such an outcome in advance. The day before the birth, a very frank and sensual conversation took place between them. Patricia was lying on a hospital bed in the VIP room for women in labor. Paul was sitting next to her on the chair and finishing the fifth chapter of the book. The only source of light was a floor lamp. The doctors recommended the future mother to rest not only her body, but also her spirit, and the white light of the hospital lamps had a very negative effect on her emotional state. That is why it was decided to put a floor lamp in the room. This room was in principle very cozy. The price corresponded to the quality. Paul found for his wife one of the best hospitals in the city, as he once said at the wedding, to my wife all the best and after five years of marriage he still kept his word. A real man. It took them a long time to get pregnant. At first the doctor said that my wife was infertile. She ran around to different hospitals, but all the doctors said the same thing. There was no hope of having children of her own. Patricia had already lost this very hope, but one day she went to another private clinic, which she was advised by a friend and she was not mistaken. Here she was really helped. However, immediately warned that the risk of death in the state of her health is very high, but the woman still decided to give birth. She really wanted to give her husband an heir. Paul had long persuaded his wife not to do this. He really loved her sincerely. If she died, he would also die inside. But his wife assured him that everything would be all right. They often quarreled on this subject, but then Paul realized that Patricia would not give up. She had always dreamed of a child, and he of an heir. Both hoped that they would have a healthy boy, but fate decided otherwise. Another ultrasound showed that soon they will have a girl. The future parents were not the least bit upset by this news. Paul, to Patricia's surprise, even rejoiced. They arranged her room, bought everything necessary for the first time. The crib was made of high-quality natural materials. Paul himself supervised all the arrangement of the new room in their big house. He told his wife not to worry about anything, she only had to take care of herself and the future child. She had to eat well, exercise moderately, and take the necessary vitamins. She followed all the doctor's recommendations, and the pregnancy went well without any complications. And finally, the day of labor came. It turned out to be quite exciting, especially for Paul. Paul, Paul, Patricia shouted, waking up her husband at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm in labor, get up. As soon as the man heard those cherished words, he immediately jumped out of bed and ran to the suitcases he had prepared in advance. He called the driver, who had also been instructed in advance. Together they went to the hospital. They lived outside the city in a large private house. They were surrounded by a piece of almost untouched taiga forest. The air here was very clean. That's why the family had chosen this place to make their cozy nest here and put down roots. It was an hour and a half drive to the city. All this time Patricia was making horrible cries, sighs, moans. The contractions were truly unbearable. However, when the couple arrived at the hospital, the doctor said that these were false contractions. The waters, of course, have not yet broken, but the doctor strongly recommended to stay in the hospital. Since the real labor was going to start any day now. They, of course, were allocated a separate paid room. 
Everything was already arranged for a comfortable stay of mother and child. By evening Patricia had some inexplicable feeling of anxiety, and she decided to share it with her husband. Darling. Patricia said in a tired voice. Paul broke away from reading the book and looked at his beloved wife. He stood up and slowly approached her, covering her hands with his palms, he asked. What has happened my soul? It sounded so tender and pleasant, from Paul came some special aura of real family happiness and comfort, protection. Patricia always felt next to him, like under the side of an angel. The doctor said that the labor might be difficult and that there was a chance that I might. No, Paul said harshly. Don't you dare say that. However, I want to keep myself and our baby safe. Please, if I am, Patricia hesitated for a moment. If I am gone, take care of our girl, she said confidently and openly. She felt Paul's muscles visibly tense at the last one. The last phrase almost caused a fit of anger in him, but he himself realized that he had to reason rationally, to think about all the consequences. But, of course, he hoped that nothing dire would happen. You will not die. Paul again assured his wife firmly. Honey you can't know for sure and. Paul stood up abruptly and moved away from Patricia. He pressed his forehead against the window pane and thought about something for a long time, and then he heard his wife's gentle voice. Paul. I love you. This voice always soothed him. It was like a gentle whistle, the singing of a nightingale. The voice was so gentle, melodious, long. He wanted to drown in the sound. Paul broke away from the wall and looked at his beloved again. I love you too, Patricia. Answered the man. And I promise that our daughter will have the best life. But promise me that you will not go to that world. Don't leave me, please. A tear rolled down his face. It was very rare to see this strong man in such a mood. You could see that he was terribly worried. Every cell of his body. Paul loved Patricia like hell. Such bright people shouldn't leave so soon. I can't promise you anything, Paul, the woman said frustratedly. But I want you to know. My love for you is boundless. I do not know Paul. Today in a dream I saw my death. It's a bad sign. I have a bad feeling about it. So I thought I'd warn you. If I'm gone, give our girl this. Patricia took off her pendant and handed it to her husband. Patricia. No. He said in shock, pushing the pendant away from him. You yourself will give it to our daughter. Do you understand? Patricia returned the pendant to her chest. Paul looked sympathetically into her eyes once more. There was something troubling in his gaze. It was as if he were trying to avoid the storm that was about to overtake them. He kissed his beloved on the forehead and returned obediently to his chair, for Patricia was very tired and closed her eyes immediately after the kiss, but her sleep did not last long. It was already four o'clock in the morning when Paul awoke from his own troubled slumber to hear Patricia's exhausted screams. The moans were as if they came from the depths of hell. He only opened his eyelids when a nurse appeared in front of him, shouting something to him, but he did not understand a word. The girl threw a sheet of some kind over Paul, examining him more closely. The man realized that it was a medical coat. Wait a minute. Why do I need a robe? Paul was indignant. He saw out of the corner of his eye his wife being taken away on a stretcher. She was writhing in pain. She was being held by the hands of several doctors. Oh, my God. Aren't you going to give birth with your wife? It's written in the contract that it's a joint delivery, the nurse said in a panic, while frantically looking at the documents. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I got it mixed up. You? Yes, my God. Paul couldn't stand it. Where's my wife? What's wrong with her? The nurse looked at him fearfully. She was much smaller than he was, and it seemed as if she were being threatened by the patient himself, hovering over her like a boulder. She clasped her hands to her chest, as if she thought someone would snatch them away or the fierce forces emanating from Paul would throw them aside. Calm down. She began in a soft voice, just as she had been taught. You need to stay here or go to the waiting room. 
take me to the goddamn waiting room, the man grumbled, rubbing his right temple. He had had a headache ever since he woke up. He waited in the waiting room of the maternity ward for several more hours. No one said anything. Everyone was bustling about, carrying some documents, diapers, and machines. He was not even allowed to see his wife, who had passed away, citing the possible spread of an unidentified infection. Now he would see her only when he would say, goodbye, to her near the coffin. A young boy stopped in the corridor and studied something in the documents, underlining with a pen. Paul, who had already given up hope, decided to try his luck. Doctor. He called out to the young man. He didn't even blink an eye, but are there so many doctors in this deserted cold corridor? Doctor, Paul called again. After the second call the young man turned around, and only then the always restrained Paul allowed himself to stand up and approach him to ask his question. Doctor. Can you tell me how my daughter is? You were present at the birth. I saw you. You must know the whole situation. The young doctor looked at Paul with sympathy. Not a single note of calmness could be found in the young man's eyes. He was agitated, very agitated. Me, mumbled the boy. I'm just an intern. I'm not allowed yet. But his incoherent speech was interrupted by the sound of the swinging doors opening, and a lush, pretty woman stepped out into the light. She looked to be at least 45. She had bright red hair, and her robe sat tightly on her strong and healthy body. Paul felt a certain insignificance in his existence when he saw her. Are you a father? She said only indifferently, and went back to her documents. Paul felt some hope and immediately answered with an affirmative nod. Let's go in, she said without looking up at him. Paul was amazed that she could walk while looking at the documents without running into anything. Suddenly, the doctor did speak, and she did not sound soothing. Your daughter is in critical condition right now. We're fighting for her life. I'll tell you right now. It's a long shot, but it's a long shot. Hang in there. Paul seemed to go into a trance after these words. The image of Patricia immediately appeared in his mind. He imagined how she had suffered in childbirth. Was it all for nothing? Had she given her life to a man who would also soon be dead? Paul felt tears coming, but the woman's gaze gave him renewed confidence. Paul. I understand how you feel, but I want to assure you. We'll do everything we can. I've seen enough cases like this before and many of them ended happily. What about my daughter? Paul shouted and stopped in the middle of the corridor. The woman looked at him with eyes full of regret. Yes, when would they stop looking at him like that? He was really annoyed that everyone here felt nothing but pity for him. He's a strong man and he'll get through anything. Your daughter had a very difficult birth. She had a birth trauma, and your wife died suddenly because of the labor. Her heart couldn't take the strain. In addition, the tests revealed a long-standing infection that was previously undetectable. If your child survives, she'll be permanently disabled, unable to move on her own. Do you understand? Those last words came out of the blue. They had been embedded in his mind for a long time. The worst thing for a parent to hear is that their child is not a walking invalid. Lifelong confinement in a chair. She'll need help all the time. Yes, she will be disabled, but only her body will be physically dysfunctional. What about her brain, her intellect? The main thing is to keep her intellect intact. She will be able to learn, to achieve everything in her chosen field of endeavor. These thoughts began to come one after another in a continuous stream. Until the obstetrician's words came to him again. We need a week for her body to fully recover. During that time, she'll be in the ICU in a special box. You can stay here, but I'd advise you to go home, and please. Hope for the best. It's no exaggeration. These are the best doctors you can find in this city, and we'll do everything we can to keep your baby alive. With these words she turned around and without waiting for an answer, as it vaporized in the darkness of the long corridor. Apparently, while he was not looking, she went into some office closed by impenetrable doors with an electronic lock. Paul had no choice but to go home. 
There was definitely nothing for him to do at the hospital. Now he had to deal with the funeral, the wake, the paperwork. There was so much turmoil, but Paul trusted this confident red-haired woman. She seemed to know her business well. Paul was frantically packing his things as if he were preparing to run away. No, he didn't need to run away and hide from anyone. It was just that this room was saturated with Patricia's scent. Her bed not yet made. The book she loved so much now lay on the nightstand, waiting for its reader. On this book Paul noticed some kind of a package, he came closer and unfolded a linen handkerchief. Inside was the very pendant that his wife had tried to give him the day before. Paul had once given it to Patricia as a token of his eternal love. It was a gold fish with emerald eyes on a gold twisted chain. The jewelry was made to order. He gave it to his wife on their first anniversary. Of course, then he gave a lot of other gifts, much more expensive and prestigious, but for some reason this pendant Patricia cherished as the apple of her eye. She always said that this pendant was very, very special. It promised good luck. Paul's thoughts automatically replayed the voice of his late wife. He pressed this pendant as tightly as possible to his chest and allowed himself to let a stingy male tear. Luck is not on our side today, Patricia, the man whispered through his tears. When he arrived home with suitcases full of his late wife's things. The first thing Paul did was to put everything in the closets. The items were all soaked with her scent. He felt like a drug addict, a maniac who sniffs clothes in an attempt to get pleasure, but he had nothing else. Nothing left of her. That smell was the only reminder of his departed love. He sat at her closet for a long time, scrutinizing every piece, how he missed that warmth. Patricia was his fire, the light that illuminated even the darkest day. He remembered her happy, always cheerful smile. That smile would forever remain in his memory. It's very rare to find someone so much like you. To find that soul mate to whom you can entrust all the secrets of your soul. But Paul had found such a person, but lost him very quickly. But they dreamed of being an ordinary family, that their house was filled with children's laughter, and little feet stomped on the floor. Now Paul was broken. More than ever he needed help, support, love. Patricia used to give him all of that, but now he had no one else to turn to. There were too many jealous people around. If they're willing to help in any way, then they've already seen the benefits for themselves. The orphan Paul lay for a long time in his and Patricia's bedroom. He remembered an ordinary morning, of which there were hundreds. Patricia was alive and well. Running around the room, going somewhere. She jokingly yells at her husband that she has nothing to wear. Then she realizes that there is very little time left and runs to the dressing table to put on makeup. And Paul looks at her with a sincere smile and cannot believe his happiness. How lucky he is. She has replaced everyone and his friend, his lover, and even his co-workers. How many times she gave him very sound advice that really helped him in business. Why? Why do such people leave us so early? There was no answer to that question. It was time to get out of bed, too much he had laid here today. The first thing Paul did was to go to the study, and on the way he noticed that the door to the nursery was slightly ajar. He cautiously opened the door and looked around the room. He and Patricia had been working on this nursery for months. Harmonious colors, stroller, cradle, toys. Now everything would have to be replaced with slightly different things. It was necessary to create a comfortable space for a girl who would not have walking legs. Paul still hoped in his heart that it was all a mistake. He hoped that his daughter would recover and be like other children, but soon all his hopes collapsed at once. A couple of days later he received a call from the hospital and was informed that the child had been saved. However, and warned she had atrophied lower limbs. Paul was allowed to pick up the girl the following Monday. That is, for another week the man had to live all alone. Although some part of his soul was even glad of this circumstance. He would settle all matters concerning his wife and the equipment of the child, and then all ready to deal only with his daughter. As soon as he learned about the diagnosis, he immediately called several doctors from Germany, Japan, and Switzerland. Two of them agreed to help. 
Of course, all these operations cost an awful lot of money, but it was definitely not a problem for Paul. He owned a lot of capital, cooperated with many successful companies. His baby would have a good inheritance. He only really did not want the press to learn about his daughter's illness. All matters concerning the child were done in complete privacy. Soon a special custom-made chair, massage table and orthopedic bed were made for him for the future when the girl comes out of infancy. He consulted the doctors for a long time, and they prescribed various drugs and injections that could alleviate the child's condition. The red-haired midwife herself said that there were cases when a child with complete atrophy of limbs suddenly recovered. Learn to walk and do things on their own. The main thing is to deal with this problem as early as possible. Of course, Paul did not forget about his dead wife. While solving the problems concerning the health of the newborn, he also dealt with the funeral. A funeral should be held on the third day after death. On September 3, the coffin with Patricia's body was brought to the cemetery. Not many people came. There were Patricia's friends, Paul's friends. Of course, close relatives, but all numbered no more than 20 people. Everyone was crying and offering their sincere condolences. Although Paul knew very well that for most they were not sincere. These friends were jealous of Patricia. It was just good for them to be friends with her. All this blatant hypocrisy on their part had a terrible effect on Paul's condition. To think that some of these horrible women even tried to flirt with him right in the cemetery, at the funeral of his beloved wife. Where was the world going? As soon as he threw a handful of earth into the fresh grave and the coffin was buried, he immediately left that awful place where his dear Patricia was forever. Very quickly the cherished week passed and it was finally possible to pick up my daughter from the clinic. Paul was very anxious that day. He took several sedative pills, but the anxiety did not go away. He was afraid. Afraid that he wouldn't be able to cope. Any mistake seemed fatal, but still he gathered his will into a fist and got into the car. The weather was unusually rainy, and it was pouring like a bucket. It was not uncommon in the first days of September, but Paul saw warning signs in everything. Even the weather is mocking me, he thought to himself. The roads were almost deserted. The early yellowed trees threw their dying leaves to the wind, the strong north wind shook the wires and turned over the stray birds. Nature itself seemed to be pining for the dead Patricia along with him. The driver stopped 100 meters from the hospital, he couldn't get any closer. All the parking spaces were taken. At another time Paul would have insisted that they drive under the barrier, but now he didn't care. Passing by the photographer standing at the ready and a joyful man with an armful of flowers. Paul lowered his head and walked to the pathology department. Probably meeting a happy wife and child? He thought with a pang of envy. And what about him? What had all the money, all the connections given him? Everything he owned? He is utterly defenseless against death. We all scatter like ants. Running back and forth in a frantic attempt to grab some of the Earth's goods. And in the end? When we go back to where we came from, we don't take with us a fraction of what we had in life. Could it be that it's all just in our minds? These intrusive thoughts literally haunted Paul. He fought down the nausea that came over him at the sight of the familiar hospital doors. He opened them with an effort, passed the guard post, nodded to the machine gunner and took the elevator to the desired room. A red-haired midwife was walking toward him, holding a baby wrapped up to the nose in a cocoon of diapers. She smiled affectionately as she held out the little treasure to Paul. At first it startled him. He even looked away for a moment, but then he realized that it was his own child, his, no one else's responsibility in the whole world. He took the tiny defenseless creature in his arms. What was his surprise when he saw a perfectly healthy infant? There was nothing to indicate that this child was handicapped from birth. The tiny girl was awake. She was looking directly at her father and even tried to smile at him. At least it seemed that way to him. God, how beautiful she was. Excuse me, but why do you think she is disabled? Paul asked the doctor in bewilderment. She is tightly swaddled now, but her arms and legs don't function, the doctor explained. Not even her arms? Paul was horrified. 
but you only spoke about atrophy of the lower limbs. Unfortunately, not everything is in the power of medicine, the doctor shook her head sadly. You can, of course, sue our clinic, but I assure you. We did what we could. Paul was shocked and silent, he was certainly not prepared for such a development. Let's go to the office, you have to get the discharge papers. That voice sounded like a dream, arms and legs. Oh, my god. Why? I mean, she just came into this world, but she. She's smiling better than any baby, Paul murmured, with a kind of inner protest and tenderness at the same time. Perhaps such children are often more intelligent than others. Take care of her, daddy, the woman smiled and walked away, leaving Paul alone with his child that would change his life dramatically, but he would not give up. Well, little Eva. Let's get acquainted. I'm your daddy, he said to his daughter. Come with you to the car. As quickly as possible, he left the scary place, holding the child gently to him. It was not by chance that Paul had chosen such a name for his daughter. He and his wife had discussed it for a long time. They always had arguments. Paul wanted an ordinary American name, unremarkable. He argued that they were already receiving a lot of attention from the press because of his wealth and position. Patricia, on the contrary, was inclined to some mythological ancient and rare names. This was the name she had chosen. Worn by the very Eve the progenitor of mankind. She thought it was very airy and elegant. Her husband always spoke out strongly against it, but when Patricia passed away Paul decided that it was necessary to name the girl as the mother wanted. It was his moral duty. It was necessary somehow to thank his wife for all her hard work. She had given her life for this little one, and now Paul would give his own for Eva. The first thing they did was to go to Germany. Their little Eva was to undergo the most difficult operation on her legs. The doctor promised that after the operation Eva's legs would become stronger and she would be able to walk. The little girl was hospitalized for a month. Paul, staying in a hotel nearby, often woke up in a cold sweat. He thought he could hear her screams at night but he reassured himself that it was for her own good. She was suffering now, but she would thank him later, but all his efforts were in vain. A month later, the little girl still couldn't even move a finger. Let alone a whole leg. But Paul had given so much money for treatment, and it was all for nothing. Of course, he was reimbursed half of the cost, but most importantly, he didn't get his time back. Wasted time. The doctors at the maternity hospital warned him to act quickly. Since this little organism grows every day and each day can be decisive. Paul was terribly hurt that he had let his little girl down like that. As an adult, she would no longer remember this suffering. However, some psychological trauma would stay with her forever. This torment was indeed comparable to torture, but what brought him the most moral anguish was that it was futile. Paul was already doubting whether they should go to Japan. If he had not been helped here in Germany by some of the best doctors in the world. The hope for a favorable outcome in Japan was fading with every second. He flew on his private jet home to his native country. Next to him in a portable cradle slept his favorite daughter and on the opposite sat his driver and part-time security guard and a very good friend. For many, many years of working together, they had become quite close. They had gone through so much together, it would be enough for a dozen lives. What's the boss thinking about? Albert's voice came up. He had a very low voice. He always spoke in a bass voice, which scared a lot of people away. But it was this quality that Paul had recognized in Albert when he first saw him. The guard's mission was first to scare away undesirable people, and then to protect and fight. There's no point in going to Japan, Paul said thoughtfully, looking out the airplane window. It was night and the clouds had thickened. So it was impossible to see any colorful pictures. Yes, Paul was not interested in it. He looked there only to avoid looking at his child, whom he wanted to help so much, but he was powerless. Why? Albert asked. Paul turned away from the window and looked at his guard, he had a really interested look. He clearly wanted to help, and indeed sometimes he did. The man's advice was always excellent. When Paul asked half-jokingly where better to take Patricia on a first date, 
Albert immediately offered his idea, and it turned out to be not a banal restaurant. That evening they climbed to the roof of the highest high-rise in the Arab Emirates and watched the starry sky. Memories of that distant date filled Paul's thoughts. Well, can I finally open my eyes? Patricia asked insistently. The tight bandage did not allow even a little peek through the fabric, and the girl often stumbled from the step, while he led her to the very height. Now open it, he authorized, stepping back a step. Patricia had a stunning view of the city at night. There were so many lights. Right on the roof there was an improvised loft-style table with a plate of selected fruit, seafood and two glasses of wine, and next to it there was a crystal bucket with a fogged bottle. Paul. It's so beautiful here. Patricia was mesmerized. He brought her a glass of wine and smiled. She gratefully accepted it and came closer to the edge of the parapet. The view was breathtaking. There were at least 70 stories below them. It was as if they were looking at the world through God's eyes. I knew you'd like it. Paul sipped some wine and looked directly into her eyes. It was impossible to look away from that smile, from that delighted face. The surprise was indeed a success. Now look up, he suggested. His chosen one immediately raised her head, her eyes reflecting the entire cosmos visible to us at that moment. Sometimes it seems as if the world is made up of a thousand stars, Paul said. These lights reflecting light are the stars, and our world is a real arc among them. They looked for a long time into the expanse of that endless sky. This is where they had their first kiss. After the end of this most magical evening of her life, Patricia said to him. I thought you were like other rich men. You take a girl to a restaurant to get her into bed quickly and then dump her for nothing. But a date on the roof of a skyscraper, I've never had that before. I'm glad I was able to please you Patricia, Paul leaned toward her and kissed her tenderly. Albert's voice suddenly snatched him out of these happy memories. So why is it pointless to go to Japan? Paul felt as if he had woken up from the most marvelous dream. Reality unsettled him. How he would like to stay forever in this unforgettable evening, and now he had to decide alone how best to help their daughter. Oh, if only Patricia were there. I don't think they'll help us there, he said aloud. Japan is a developed country. But Germany is not unlike it in its professionalism in the field of medicine. But it's better to do your best than to fail and regret it for the rest of your life. You may fail, but at least you tried. Or do we have other options to help this little girl? Paul thought for a moment, then answered. You know, you very often give very good food for thought, but now I do not intend to reason. I have to act. After these words there was a moment's silence, and then Paul broke it again. We are going to Japan. He said decisively. And here before them was this small country with a terrific climate, beautiful mountains, cherry blossoms, and clear fragrant air. Paul would have enjoyed traveling through this enchanting land so much if. If only he hadn't come here alone, but widowed, lonely, determined to purposefully heal his only daughter. A doctor examined little Eva on the first day. This private hospital offered to do the impossible. To cure the hands that were completely devoid of movement, but even here Paul already suspected something wrong. In Germany he had been promised the same thing, the same miracle. However, it all turned out to be just a beautiful advertising cover and lost time. There was no risk. Eva was just coming back from the operation on her legs, which did not bring any result, and now if this operation is unsuccessful, the girl's health will be noticeably shaken. After all, she was still a baby. This little girl was only two months old, and she had already gone through something that few adults can endure. The health of such children is always fragile and any surgical intervention can be fatal, but Paul decided to take the last risk. He believed that in the end, something might work. After all, these were not some shamans who promised to cure you with incantations and rituals. These were highly trained doctors, the best of the best. Japan's medicine is rightly considered one of the most advanced in the world. Paul and his daughter were put in a separate room. It was very cozily furnished. Everything was decorated in a modern style and at the same time with a touch of national culture. Large panoramic windows, soft carpet. 
a sitting area where there was a sofa, a coffee table and tatami. There was a large flat screen TV and even a mini bar, but Paul considered it inappropriate. How could he have fun, drink alcohol and watch TV while his poor little daughter was undergoing a complicated operation? After the operation in Germany, Eva began to sleep more often. Doctors explained it by the fact that she had suffered terrible stress and of course it affected the body and the mode of sleep. The baby cried a lot. Her father tried to calm her down, but she would not calm down. Probably, mom would know how to calm you down, Paul said sadly, rocking the little girl in his arms. She had been cranky half the night and seemed to be exhausted. In the morning the little girl was already taken away. Paul prayed to the Lord, which he had never done before. Every now and then he kissed Patricia's pendant, which was always with him, and looked out of the window for a long time. At about three o'clock in the afternoon the door opened and Eva was brought into the room on a small gurney. As Paul had expected, his daughter was unconscious. The medics entered, said something in their own language, made calming gestures and left. The doctor who had directly performed the operation came in after them. He was a tired, representative-looking Japanese man who spoke good international English. We are doing well, Paul, he said to his worried father, smiling and folding his hands in front of him. He bowed slightly to him, expressing his reverence. The operation was a success. Your daughter is still sleeping, but she will wake up very soon. There will be a doctor on duty in the room 24 hours a day. This is necessary to monitor the condition of our little patient. The exhausted father hurriedly looked at his treasure. Her arms were framed by two plastic bracelets, in which some tubes were inserted at special places. The young doctor who remained in the room smiled cordially at Paul and kept filling out some paperwork. The minutes dragged on for what seemed like an eternity. Paul asked the resident how long he had to wait and, having received an answer, decided that he would have time to visit the head doctor of the clinic before Eva woke up. Come in, said a steady voice when there was a knock at the door. Paul entered the huge, luxurious office. In front of him immediately appeared the chief physician himself at his desk. At the back hung a painting the full height of the room, which depicted the main symbol of Japan, the Sakura. It was hard not to recognize that this painting did have some kind of calming effect. I'm here about my daughter Eva, Paul said from the doorway. The doctor looked at the man carefully and then pointed to a low chair. He sat down. The doctor flipped through his numerous papers and then looked at Paul. Your daughter, she had surgery today, he said calmly. He really had a lot of clients and it was impossible to remember them all, for sure. Therefore, Paul took this beginning with understanding. Eva. Once again clarified the head of the clinic. Paul answered with an affirmative nod. Well, well. She had a successful operation. She should be under observation for three days. After a full examination of the results, we will decide what to do next. What are the chances of success? Chances? The doctor asked in bewilderment. I mean, are you sure you can help my daughter? That her hands will be able to function? Paul. The doctor began seriously and even got up from his desk. He walked around his workplace and sat down opposite the man in another chair, spreading his legs and crossing his arms. No surgery can give a complete guarantee that the problem will completely disappear. Pardon the comparison, but even disinfectant packaging says it only kills 99% of bacteria. Not 100%, you know what I'm saying? We can't make any exact guarantees. People are always unsure about something, but it's not our fault. It's the way the world works. It's the creator's fault, if you will. He created a world where there are a lot of assumptions and uncertainties. Where it's completely randomized who dies today and who lives. I just want to assure you that my experience is very long and my practice helps a lot of people. But if you don't give back. What kind of return are you talking about? More money. You can have it today. Just help me, Paul begged. Hear me. The doctor couldn't stand it. I don't need your money. If life were free I would perform these operations for free. My goal is to help people, not to get more money in my wallet. 
Your daughter needs support. She is too little, but... She's not just a baby. She's only a couple months old, Paul interrupted. She is maybe a baby, the doctor persisted. But at this age, children feel everything emotionally, they take in information from sounds, surroundings, and people around them. That is why I want her to feel your presence. She must realize that you are near. After all, it is not only physical factors that influence our condition. Emotions also help us to live. Now, where are you right now? What do you mean? Paul didn't understand. In your office, of course. But you should be at your little daughter's bedside, supporting her, being close to her. Do you understand? I understand you doctor, Paul summed up, thanked the doctor dryly, and left the office. His world felt as if it had just turned upside down. No, not even so. He just didn't expect to get such a lecture. In the beginning he was skeptical of this advice, but subsequent events fully confirmed the doctor's words. A few hours after this conversation, Paul was sitting in the room next to the crib and Eva, drinking coffee and absent-mindedly reading his book. Suddenly some melody came into his head and he started humming it, and suddenly he heard a sound like a rather chirping. It was Eva waking up, which seemed strange to him, because after the operation she had been crying. It was understandable. The girl was not even strong yet, and she had already been taken to various doctors, intervened in her tiny body, cut and picked with surgical instruments. Many adults would have fallen into a prolonged depression at such a situation. So Paul carefully put the book aside and looked into the crib with glass sides. His daughter was lying on her back with her head turned toward him, gazing at him with her big eyes and smiling. What made you so happy? Her father asked her affectionately. Maybe your yellow bee? Yes, do you like it? He lightly touched the toy hanging over the crib, it swung and made a soft melodious tinkling sound, but the girl did not even turn her head in its direction. What amused you, Eva? Naively asked her father again and showed her the other toys. Of course Eva did not answer her father, but the faint smile disappeared from her face. Paul was very upset by this circumstance. He had just seen his daughter's first conscious smile and even something like laughter. And now there was an indifferent grimace on her face again. Paul, came the voice of the resident's doctor on duty. At this time he was tactfully in another part of the large room, so as not to interfere with the communication between father and child. Did you want something? Paul answered him politely. Yes, if I may, the doctor came closer. Your daughter was amused by a song. A song? The father asked incredulously. Yes, the resident nodded, a happy smile playing on his face. Children love to have songs sung to them. Sing her some more Paul. Paul shrugged his shoulders. He purred the tune quite unknowingly. It seems that the first time they had heard it together with Patricia was when they were walking in a big beautiful park during some romantic date. And Patricia again. The man tried to drive away his thoughts of her, but every little thing reminded him of her eyes, her lips, her hair. Little Eva looked an awful lot, like her mother especially her big eyes. Paul sat back in his chair and began to hum that simple tune again. Suddenly he heard again a sound like muffled laughter. He stopped and listened, fearing that it was all in his head, but no, it was really happening. Little Eva was really smiling quite a bit and trying to laugh and again for some unknown reason. Paul moved closer to his daughter and watched her closely. He hummed the song to her once more and smiled and tickled her tummy with his finger. Once again Eva smiled happily, toothless, and made a laughing chirp. Do you like this song? Paul asked her gently. The girl smiled again, as if understanding him. It was then that he realized the true meaning of his recent conversation with the doctor in charge of the clinic. That's what he meant when he said to support the child emotionally. Little children really do feel everything. This was a real revelation to Paul. In the days that followed, all sorts of things happened. It was painful and difficult, but this was the way the attentive father always calmed his tiny daughter. When she started to cry, Paul would play the music on his phone, and often he would hum it himself, soothing and lulling her to sleep. Then she fell asleep very quickly. 
Who knew, Paul thought, that a child could be soothed by the favorite songs of his mother who had passed away. On the third day a whole retinue of doctors came to the ward, headed by the advocate of emotional contact, already familiar to Paul. It was time to check on Eva's condition. Many doctors surrounded the girl's crib, and the father was asked to stay away. For long minutes, which seemed to Paul like an eternity, they did not leave Eva's side, discussed something among themselves, wrote in their notebooks, poked at the tablets they had brought, and then they all went out the door at once. Before Paul could even wake up, the ward was completely empty, and he was left in the dark again. What was wrong with his daughter? How are her hands? What to do next? He felt his own hands treacherously trembling. But after a couple minutes, the head doctor re-entered the room. He was holding a clipboard and kept writing something down, walking towards Paul. So, he began seriously, adjusting his glasses and looking at the notes. With our little hands, everything is as it should be. Or rather, of course, it could be better, but… What do you mean? Paul was indignant. In the sense that it is a baby and for her hands it is normal, calmly answered the doctor. They did respond with the necessary reaction. Now there are a few more important procedures to be done. What are they? We will apply a weak electric current of a certain frequency and we will also apply some know-how of our clinic. You'll see for yourself. I guarantee it's safe. But you'll have to stay here for another month. A month? Paul shrieked. He had certainly not expected such a long period. Last time he just wasted a month. Hush, hush. You'll frighten your child, the doctor soothed. Why react like that? Time, doctor. I have very little time. What if it fails and everything is a failure? I must do everything I can for her before six months. I assure you, everything will be fine. The result is already there, and you can see for yourself. With these words the surgeon went to the crib where Eva was sleeping and called Paul to him. The man approached incredulously, looking at the doctor, but in the meantime he took the tiny hand of the girl and forcefully pulled her middle finger. For which he got a very negative reaction from the father. What are you doing? He hissed in a whisper. But the surgeon did not move and gestured to Paul to observe and suddenly the girl's hand shook faintly and squeezed the doctor's finger. Paul was amazed. Was he not mistaken in his choice of clinic and everything was not in vain? Try it yourself, the doctor suggested. Paul carefully lowered his hand and put his finger in the girl's palm. He quietly pulled her middle finger and really felt the response. Eva was able to do it again. Oh my god, it's working. It's working. Doctor please cure her and her feet with the same technique. I'll pay any money, Paul exclaimed, shaking the doctor's hands violently. But after that, the surgeon's face darkened and he shook his head from side to side. I'm afraid it's impossible. He stated emphatically. The arms and legs are very differently constructed and there is no technology that can make them mobile with this diagnosis. Even if we amputate them and insert artificial ones, they won't work. So how do we explain it in simple terms? The brain doesn't get the information that this organ exists. That's the most accurate way to put it. But you've helped the hands. The hands are different. They weren't completely disconnected from the nervous system. I'm a neurosurgeon, the esteemed Paul. A surgeon with many years of experience and I know what I'm talking about. We've done a lot of research on this subject. If there's even the slightest chance of recovery. I'm doing everything and, as you can see, I'm succeeding. So Eva will never be able to walk? Paul said in despair, staring into the void. It was as if his mind was in another dimension. He was trying to find an answer to why this was happening? Why is this happening to his child? After all, he could do everything he could with his money. There was no way he could accept this diagnosis. Then he felt a warm hand on his shoulder. I know it's hard for you to accept, but you can live with it. You'll give her a good education. She'll be able to do things with her hands. Not all of life is about walking. Believe me. The next days passed like the previous ones. 
Eva was recovering from the operation, but now she had real needles inserted into her hands every day. Medical needles, of course. They were very thin and long, as the doctor explained, it didn't hurt at all. The girl didn't feel a thing. They were so thin that they had the sole function of pressing certain points in the nerve endings. It was a common practice in Japan. Indeed, it was scientifically proven that in the human body there are certain points with the help of which you can be cured of such a disease. The procedure lasted a month. At the end of this therapy the result was obvious. Eva could move her arm completely. She picked up toys, squeezed a ball and did various exercises, and by the end of the course her hands were fully functional. Her father cried with happiness. He had taken the most active part to bring about this result. He sat with her all day long, did special exercises, sang songs and read books to her, fed her from a bottle and told her 100 times a day that she was the most beloved and the best girl in the whole world. So, it wasn't just the doctors who did it. After a month they were finally able to fly home. Now Paul began to lead a life devoted to his daughter. He delegated most of his business duties to a trusted agent. Almost all of his time now belonged to Eva. Of course, sometimes there were situations when business required his personal presence and only in such cases Paul invited a nurse. It was quite rare. The man really spent a huge amount of time with his daughter, staying up at night, getting up at every rustle. He read a lot of books on how to take care of infants. He walked his treasure every day and occasionally even went out on the town to socialize the baby. Sometimes there were situations where single moms would hit on him. Oh, what a cute little girl you have! exclaimed the mother, also walking with the stroller. Yes, she looks just like her mother. Replied Paul proudly. And where is your mommy sunshine? Looked in the stroller, to Eva. Her mother passed away, Paul answered firmly, moving away from the annoying mother. Women like that had light bulbs in their eyes that turned on with joy. Whether because they first of all paid attention to the latest model of iPhone in the hands of a young father, his expensive watches and clothes. Or because they were desperate to find a life partner, but Paul never gave in to such provocations. Once he and Eva had been chased by one such restless lady. Oh, I'm sorry. I suddenly caught up with you again. You walk slowly, said the woman with whom they had parted on a rather dry note about 15 minutes ago. Paul went in the opposite direction, but she was there again. But you are in a hurry. Paul replied with a grin, quickening his step. But the woman stuck to him like gum. We walk a lot, she chirped happily. The baby needs more fresh air. Oh, why didn't I even introduce myself? Miranda, let's get acquainted, the woman held out her hand. Paul didn't even look at her, but just mumbled. That's a beautiful name. The mother obviously did not get the hint and continued to pry. And what's your name? And I'm already called to lunch, have a nice day. Sarcastically stated the man and, reaching his car near where his driver was standing, took the child in his arms and sat on the passenger seat, watching the offended looks of this very Miranda. She even snorted at him with obvious indignation. Merciless time passed, erasing from Paul's memory the features of his late wife. One day he woke up and was horrified to find that he barely remembered her voice, while Eva grew and developed like any normal child. The only difference between her and the others was that she couldn't walk. Every little accomplishment she made was a celebration for her loving father. One evening he sat by her crib and read her a book about sleeping beauty. Suddenly Eva exclaimed. Daddy. Look, look. I'm a real princess too. She put a lace pillowcase on her head and was very happy. Paul even jumped up in surprise. He looked at his little girl, she was laughing and waving her arms. He took her in his arms and kissed her forehead as tenderly as he had kissed his late wife the last time they met. It was the fifth year, the girl had long grown out of the cradle and now she had her own mini-bed with all the comforts. Orthopedic mattress, comfortable pillow, borders. Everything to make his daughter feel comfortable. Every day a special masseur did her leg exercises, bending, extending, extending, extending. 
doctors said that it was necessary to avoid problems with muscles, lungs, skin, and the condition of the body as a whole. Sometimes the girl was capricious and would not let him do it, and then Paul would motivate her with a game. One had to imagine that she was an astronaut and they always needed to exercise to feel good. That was the way to achieve complete obedience. The girl would immediately become more submissive and calm. Eva was developed beyond her years. Paul decided not to give her to a kindergarten for children with disabilities and brought her up on his own, teaching at home. The best teachers coped with their task brilliantly. By the age of six she was already reading fluently, knew almost all the multiplication tables and elementary English, but most of all the girl liked literature. Eva adored fairy tales. Every time she read a book, she was amazed that letters could form such beautiful words. Her illness did not interfere with her daily life. Eva did not grow up a recluse at all, her father often took her to development centers, on holidays, for walks, to theaters, concerts and exhibitions. Several times a year they went on vacation and improved their health to different resorts and boarding houses. All of her father's enormous money was at her service. By the age of seven, Eva was very developed intellectually. Books were a big part of her world. Everything was possible here in this magical world and she didn't need real legs at all. Sometimes little children would run up to her on the street and ask her. What is that car she's sitting on? Her customized wheelchair really looked like a mini spaceship. The children asked to ride in it, but the girl importantly explained to them that it was her personal throne. Only for Princess Eva. She was not the least bit offended by such attention from passers-by. She was well aware that she was not like ordinary children. But thanks to her father's efforts, she had always considered it her highlight. Unfortunately, such gentle comments from the children about her physical condition were short-lived. When Eva turned seven, the question of school became acute. Secondary education was still to be obtained, and after it, and profile and higher education. At first, her father offered her homeschooling, then a special school for the same children with limited abilities, like herself, and received a real scandal from his favorite daughter. I want to go to a regular school, dad. I don't want to feel inferior. Put me in the simplest school possible. Well, my father said thoughtfully. I guess you're right. There will be no separation in life between regular people and handicapped darlings. You'll have to compete with all kinds of people, and most of them will have more physical abilities than you. It doesn't make you worse by any means, but they will always have that advantage. It's a cruel world Eve. It's best for you if you realize this as early as possible. September 1st came. Before that, Paul had taken Eva shopping for a long time, so that she could choose something she liked. In the end, they decided on a strict blue dress with a white apron, the classic version. Paul took Eva to a good hairdresser, and she got a beautiful hairdo of long, shiny hair. They hung her backpack on a special hook of her wheelchair, and with great joy Eva went with her father to her first real school. The girl was terribly nervous before her very first day of school. Her hands were sweating and trembling, and in her eyes, despite all the joy, there was fear. Hey, honey. Her dad called out to her as they rode in the car. It's gonna be okay. I assure you, you're smarter than all the kids in this class. Everyone's going to like you right away. You'll see. Well, cheer up. The girl looked at him and smiled. However, she continued to be nervous. Her father stood next to her for the whole line. And when the children began to enter the school, he left. Of course, the class teacher had been warned in advance about the girl's health. Paul returned to the car and waited. He was so tired during this last week. Too many nerves had been spent. The endless choice of clothes, whims, tears, parent-teacher conferences. How do ordinary women put up with all this? The exhausted father did not even notice how he fell asleep stretched out on the seat. Paul woke up far from the melodious singing of birds. He was startled awakened by the loud slamming of the driver's door, and then by Albert's loud shouts. Wait Eva. Eva. Paul whirled out of the cabin and ran to find out what had happened. The first thing he saw was his security guard driver running through the schoolyard behind the wheelchair. 
Albert. What happened? Paul shouted. From the wheelchair, which had stopped in the middle of the schoolyard, an eerie roar could be heard. In general, Eva was having a terrible hysteria. Eva. She is, the driver panted, trying to answer. Come on. Paul couldn't stand it. I don't know. She stopped at the car, ordered me to put her in her seat and leave immediately, and suddenly burst into tears and go off in the opposite direction. I don't understand. Suddenly, she's so hysterical. The disturbed father cautiously approached the baby carriage. Eva dear. What has happened to you? He asked as sympathetically as possible. The girl immediately stopped crying and remained silent. Her father was afraid to say another word. This oppressive silence strained him even more than the terrible tears. Patricia would have found the right words, he thought with despair. Nothing. The daughter answered firmly and rigidly. Then the father walked around the stroller and sat down opposite Eva. Thus their faces were side by side. Honey. I am your daddy and I want to help you. Paul began gently. If you wanted to help me, you wouldn't have put me in this school with such toxic children, Eva blurted out. What did they do? The man began to suspect something wrong. They. They. Eva couldn't speak, her words disappearing in tears. She stuttered with emotion. Then Paul went to his little girl and hugged her as tightly as he could. Daddy, the little girl cried into her father's sweater. They are so bad, Daddy. All people are cruel sometimes dear poor little girl. They said, because I had no legs, I was a robot. They said I wasn't human, Daddy, and then they started to take my chair apart. They were stopped by the teacher who noticed this when she came into the classroom. Was the teacher leaving you? Paul was indignant. She said she had urgent business to attend to, and they're like animals. I tried to explain to them that you shouldn't do that, that I needed that stroller. And they said it had to be confirmed. Confirm that I'm not a robot and I have to stand up with this thing. I hate them. She just screamed that last one. It was a real cry of the soul. It took a long time for her father to calm her down. Even when she was home and finally able to put her to bed. After closing the door, he headed for his office, meeting Albert on the way. I'll go to that teacher tomorrow. Have her fired for such irresponsibility, he said threateningly to the guard. The guard nodded understandingly. He felt sorry for Eva himself. It wasn't her fault that the children were so cruel. The next day Paul talked to the class teacher. She apologized for her fault and begged him not to write a complaint to the authorities, arguing that she had a small salary and could barely make ends meet, but the man did not care. His daughter was in a terrible state, and he had been preparing her for school for so long. She was so eager to learn new things, and now all motivation to learn had evaporated. That same day he made a huge complaint to the management, it reached the Ministry of Education. Of course, they took action, taking into account the personality of the complainant, and by evening the teacher was scandalously dismissed. Satisfied with his work, Paul got into his car and drove home to tell Eva this wonderful news. Maybe he shouldn't have fired the teacher. What if she couldn't find a job anymore? Albert said as he drove the car. So, it was not necessary to leave the class when they first began to get acquainted. Doesn't she know the psychology of children? Honey, daddy has a surprise for you, the man said as soon as he crossed the threshold of the apartment. A wheelchair slowly pulled out of the nursery. The girl was still very upset about yesterday's situation. She had been sitting in her room all day reading a book. Paul walked over to his daughter and handed her some kind of envelope. What is it? Perplexed, Eva asked. Open it and you will find out. The girl scrutinized the envelope. It was bright yellow in color, with flowers drawn on the edges. She couldn't wait to open it. So she looked at her father once more and opened it with determination. In it she found a doubled, folded piece of paper. She unfolded it intriguedly and read aloud. Dear Eva. We know that you are in a very bad mood right now and our team wants to improve it. We invite you to the delightful Kerala. 
Here you can bask in the sun, taste delicious cocktails, and completely relax in our Ayurveda center. She put the sheet aside and looked at Daddy. He was waiting for her reaction. Are we going on vacation to India? Eva exclaimed in a cheerful mood. That's right sunshine. Are we going? Yes. But then the girl immediately stammered and lowered her head. Her mood turned sour again. What about school? I have to study. I'm missing the whole first week, it turns out. Honey. You know more than these kids for two years. You can afford to rest. They've done a terrible thing to you. Well, I look forward to hearing from you. See you tomorrow, Bunny. Paul said, and left for his office leaving the girl in doubt. But his plan worked perfectly and the next day at breakfast she announced that she had definitely decided to go there. It's going to be a real trip. I will go like the heroes in my books, she enthused, and Paul watched that happy face and needed nothing more. Indian Kerala met them with tropical colorfulness, clean beaches and unique views of the Arabian Sea. Here stretched a veritable resort paradise. Their suite occupied an entire floor and overlooked a secluded corner of the beach. It was a wonderful addition. I hope you will appreciate our company, Miss Eva, the maid said, glanced playfully at Paul, and left. While Eva began to consider the beauty of the suite. Her father was praising himself. He wanted so much to cheer up his daughter that he made up a company that was giving a trip to India. Paul knew that she had always dreamed of going here. She had read many books about this place and had finally come here. Daddy, it's like I'm the heroine of a book. I want to go to the beach already, please, Eva exclaimed. Honey, we'll go there tomorrow. Today you need to rest after the flight, and tonight you'll have a massage, my father said intriguingly. A massage? Eva pouted disappointedly. As if I didn't have enough of that at home. Eva. This is a real Indian massage. It is carried out in full accordance with the techniques of Ayurveda, it is such an ancient Indian teaching. Our hotel has the biggest Ayurveda center in Kerala. I know what Ayurveda is, said the well-read Eva. Everything is here for you, but first we need to rest. And that was that. The next day, Eva was finally able to get to Arabian Beach. It was her blue dream. She had never seen this particular sea and this golden sand that she had sunk her feet into. They couldn't feel its warmth, but with her hands she could feel all its softness. She sat under an umbrella and read a new book. Her father had gone for a little swim in the pleasant seawater, leaving the girl in the care of the faithful Albert. He had already had his third cocktail, and not just lemonade, and was dozing off on his chaise long. Some rustling was heard from behind, and the girl turned around. A very unkempt, bearded old man was staring at her point-blank. He was squatting down to level with her just like daddy used to do when he wanted to have a serious talk with her. Hello, who are you? Eva asked. But the old man did not answer. He looked at the girl in silence for a long time. After a couple of minutes, she realized that he was some local madman, and she was frightened. Traitorous cold goosebumps crawled up her back. Albert, Eva squeaked, and wanted to shout louder, but suddenly she felt someone's warm hand on her head. She did not have time to realize anything, as in her back suddenly arose a terrible pain, from which the girl screamed terribly. It was comparable to a huge needle that went straight into the center of her spine. It was as if this stranger had pressed some painful point there. Some people from the hotel immediately came running to her screams. A sleepy Albert jumped off his lounger and her father came rushing out of the water. What are you doing, you bastard? Paul shouted at the bearded man. The man remained unperturbedly silent. He seemed to understand only his own language. International English was unknown to him. But in spite of all the commotion and Eva's shouts, the ragged man did not move an inch away from her. Paul wanted to pounce on him, but he could not even move. Then he shouted at Albert too. Why are you standing there like that? What am I paying you for? But the guard couldn't move even a finger either. It was very strange. It was as if they had all gone into a stupor at once. 
Finally, Paul felt that he could move again. He shoved the stranger sharply, and he fell on his back, grunting with pain. Get out. You don't belong here, you pervert. Shouted Eva's father in rage. The man got up, shook off the sand, gave Paul a reproachful look and left. Paul immediately turned his attention to his girl, who was already silent and only flapped her eyes in bewilderment. A hotel employee came running up and spoke frantically, hurriedly. We apologize. We will no longer allow any strangers to sneak into the hotel. Well, do your best. We came here to remove stress, not to add to it, Paul said menacingly, stroking Eva's head. The morning of the next day turned out to be truly magical. Honey, get up. You were going to go to the beach early in the morning, Paul hesitated half a word. A very strange picture was unfolding before him. Eva was sleeping in her bed, but part of her leg was sticking out from under the blanket, but it wasn't even the leg itself. The girl wiggled the toes of this leg in her sleep, and the doctors assured her that her legs were not viable at all. Paul was so stunned that he almost fainted. Eva. Eva. He woke up his daughter, shaking her as hard as he could. Wake up, come on. The girl barely opened her eyes. Come on, dad. Can I go to the beach later? I have a headache and... Eva. Eva. Your legs. Look at them. The girl immediately considered the panic in her father's words and looked at her feet. Everything was as usual. Well, feet and feet. What don't you like? They're clean, Eva whimpered, resting her head on the pillow again. She was almost asleep when her father woke her up again. Get up, my dear. I urgently need to know what's wrong with you. The girl's face wrinkled with anger. She didn't wake her father when he had a headache, but now she had to obey. Sit down. Father ordered sternly and helped her up. The girl complied with his stern request. Now try to wiggle your toes, Paul said. Eva looked at him as if he were crazy. Dad, did you fall from a palm tree yesterday? What wiggle? And then quite suddenly her toes twitched again. She herself was shocked at what she felt. She tried to wiggle her toes herself, and oh wonder, it worked. They actually obeyed her. How is that possible? Eve didn't understand. Where is that tramp? Paul panicked, jumping up and running around the room from side to side. You chased him away, Eva answered sleepily, rubbing her eyes. What was happening seemed like a dream to her. It was true that yesterday Paul had thought it was some kind of perverted maniac. Touching little girls, not speaking English. Eva's complaints of terrible back pain were attributed to fear. There were no signs of violence on her body, but now a murderous and very strange thought came into Paul's head. What if that bearded ragamuffin had helped his Eva? If it was thanks to him that this miracle had happened? They'd have to find that tramp. He must be hanging around somewhere right now, and Paul could give him any amount of money. He'll have enough to last him a lifetime. And there'll be an inheritance. He ran to ask about the tramp from the administration, from the hotel guests, from everyone who got in his way, but people only shrugged their shoulders. Finally one of the servants directed him to the local market. Everyone there knows Baba, a fat Indian woman tending the plants outside their room told him. Encouraged, my father rushed to the market. There it was indeed found out that this wizard is a vagabond hermit Sadhu Vetsai. He has no home of his own. His home is all of India. He helps the poor, cures diseases. In general, everyone is always welcome. If Saint Vetchai turns his attention to someone, that person is considered lucky to have been favored by the gods. Only now did Paul realize what a terrible mistake he had made in sending this miracle worker away. Now where would he look for him? In a very bad mood, the man returned to the room. When he went into his daughter's room, he saw her scrutinizing her toes. They were still moving. For all of them it was the truest miracle, which all their lives had been considered impossible. He Paul had already resigned himself to the fate of his Eve, and it turned out that there was a man on earth who could really help her. The next day he went to the city again. 
He tried to find out where this sorcerer, who could help him, could go. But no matter how much money he named, people would give his whereabouts. They simply did not know where this mysterious sadhu with a long unkempt beard could be hiding. The vacation had to be extended for another week. Paul did not want to give up when he was so close to a clue. He used all his connections in the search, and nothing yielded results. But one day, a note was placed in his room. The paper was old, yellow and dirty, and it was written in scrawled handwriting in broken English. Do five good deeds, your daughter will be cured. There was no signature. Paul immediately realized that it was a message from the hermit. But what did it mean? Five good deeds? What kindergarten? This is life, not a fairy tale in one of Eva's books. But Paul saw no other way out. If there was one, this was it. It was necessary to fulfill the conditions. But how would he do it? That was another question, and Paul decided to act blindly. Do as he was told. Of course, the first thing he did was to give a huge amount to charities, and give away even more money to the needy. That was the easiest thing he could do. Next, the man decided to do a really noble deed. He paid for the most complicated surgery of a girl who was dying of cancer, and he really hoped that this help would not be in vain. But, one day, his daughter gave him an idea. Daddy. You should do five good deeds. But, why are the ideas only about money? It was a really clever and profound thought. Eva was right. You can do good things not only with money. Then Paul decided to help one of the charities that helped poor children in India. Their task was to distribute free food to the poor ragamuffins, and Paul became directly involved. At first he was very reluctant to participate in such an endeavor. He was used to paying for work, not doing it, but Eva encouraged him. He remembered the purpose for which he was doing it. He agreed to do it after all. It wasn't as hard as he expected. And for a whole day he fed many hungry children. Paul himself felt warm after such a deed, and it was the third one in a row. The fourth case was completely spontaneous. A poor girl who worked in this hotel carried a visitor's huge heavy suitcases to the third floor. Of course, Paul could not pass by, and there was no selfish purpose here. Just a good upbringing, long dormant under the spud of immense wealth. Eva watched it all from around the corner, and as her father came back into the room, she applauded him. She was really proud of her dad today. His last good deed didn't work out so well. He didn't know what else he could think of. To make the old man realize that Paul had accomplished his mission. Talking to the faithful Albert, he shared this problem with him. There was silence for a while, and then the guard said. So you fired that poor Eva's teacher. I think it would be a very kind thing if you reinstated her. Paul did not immediately accept the offer. After thinking about it, however, he came to the conclusion that Albert was right. The teacher was not so wrong to punish her so severely. He asked his agents to look into it, and within a week his request was fulfilled. The class teacher was reinstated, and then, at Paul's request, the management paid her a good compensation for the temporary loss of her job. Of course, this was also his doing. When she found out about it, the unfortunate girl thanked him for a long time, and he was embarrassed by her calls and messages. One evening Eva, sitting in her stroller and looking at the stars from the panoramic window, said to her father. Daddy, you are such a good man. I'm so glad you've corrected your mistakes. Thank you, sweetheart. I do all of this for you, and most importantly, I do it with sincere motives. I love helping people, but I often forget how important it is and sometimes I need those reminders. You know what, honey? I even started to feel better, as if my soul had been aching all my life and now it has calmed down. That's the sins gone out of you, the girl explained with a giggle. Maybe so, sweetie. Maybe so. The man said thoughtfully, looking up into the vast night sky. The next day was very cool. The weather was not at all pleasant. There was a storm on the sea, and soon it began to rain. Eva and Paul decided to spend the day in the room. Now it's your turn, my father announced. Why is the pond so useless? 
You can only eat it, Eva whimpered. The pawn is definitely not useless. Sometimes it is stronger than all the other pieces. For example, in the beginning it may not be noticed by anyone, but as soon as it sneaks up on the king, then everyone gets scared. So I can win with a pawn? Yeah, just don't tell anyone you have big plans for her. Everyone must think she's of no importance to you. An hour went by and finally Eva shrieked. Paul made a hurt grimace on his face, but the girl realized that it was all just a joke and laughed loudly. Suddenly, they heard a loud clap of thunder. Paul was frightened for a second, because the sound was so powerful, and a second later a blinding lightning bolt flashed, but this time it was not the flash of light that frightened him, but his daughter's shrill cry. He turned around and saw the tramp with the long beard and the bamboo cane. He had come here quite unnoticed, as if he had been brought by the Indian gods themselves. You have fulfilled the conditions, said the hermit in a husky voice. Now it is my turn to fulfill mine. Paul was amazed that this man now spoke English as if it were his native tongue. Though he had only a beard to distinguish him from the European. And that was terribly scruffy. Otherwise he looked like the rest of the people of South Asia. Paul could not see his facial features closely, for immediately after the lightning flashed the light in the room went out, and the whole room was plunged into gloom. What is your name? Paul asked. He received only an approving look from the man. The stranger approached Eva and touched her forehead. At first Paul protested, but then he calmed himself. This man would do nothing wrong. He had already made sure of that. Can you help her? The father asked after a while. She's a little girl. Of course she can be helped, the tramp said softly. How much do I owe you? I don't take money. The only condition. You must not interfere with the treatment. In order to deprive you of any desire to find the girl. You will not know the location of the convent where I will take her. You will be forbidden to communicate until she is completely cured. How long will that take? I can't know anything for sure. It's up to the Almighty Gods. The hermit has raised his hands to the sky. I'm only suggesting you can take it or leave it. It could take years, couldn't it? Paul wondered. It's possible, agreed the old man. But for your daughter's sake, I think it's worth the risk. I can think about it. I have to pick her up today. I'll give you an hour with her. Make up your mind and say, goodbye. The man left the room, leaving Eva and her father alone. Dad, are you really going to give me to this stranger? My daughter was worried. Honey, it's up to you, but think about it. You can walk. You can live like a healthy person. But why would I do that when I may never see you again? Someday we'll meet again, and then you'll be completely healthy. I believe that. I dreamt about your mom Eva today. She said that I have to let you go, Paul shook his head. Eva was silent. She never argued with her father. He had always been right which meant he wanted the best for her now. All right, she finally answered. The wandering healer didn't have to be called back. He came back on his own as soon as they had made their decision. We will see each other soon and we will be happy, her father reassured Eva, who was beginning to cry from the excess of feelings. He stroked her delicate hands one last time and kissed her forehead. It was very much like saying, goodbye, to his wife. Back then, when the loving couple already suspected that they would never meet again. However, Paul hoped that he would not lose his daughter forever. She was the only living memory of Patricia, her bloodline, and the man decided to give the girl one thing for farewell. He put the very same pendant on her. What is it? Through tears, the daughter asked. It's your mother's jewelry. I gave it to her once because I loved her so much. Now it's yours. Your mother believed it brought good luck. Keep it safe. The girl scrutinized the goldfish with emerald eyes. It was like from the fairy tale of the fisherman and the fish. Yes, dear and now this magic fish is yours. Paul wept. He did not want to give his daughter to a stranger and did not even know where she would be taken, but such a gift of fate in their lives will not happen again. 
Maybe God himself had mercy on their family. It had been a whole year since his daughter had been taken to the convent for treatment. He'd left India, gone to work, set up his business. Everything was going his way. Of course, he missed Eva terribly. The house was completely empty without her laughter, but Paul tried to keep himself in control and not to think about her. Sometimes he had a frantic desire to leave everything and find his daughter, but he overcame it. After another year this desire became unbearable. Paul felt as if a huge part of his heart had been torn away from him. The hole grew and grew. I want to find my daughter, he said one morning to his reflection in the mirror. The search was difficult and long. India is very large and has as many monasteries as there are pharmacies in a big city. But a month later, Paul and his helpers were victorious. The monastery was located high in the mountains. Thanks to some local hustlers, Paul's agents were able to find out its location. Father went there immediately. He was afraid of changing his mind. What if he could be true to his word again? But for now, he was driven only by a sense of longing for his daughter. The nearest monastery in the city was full of people, as in all the cities of India. Paul made his way through the crowd, climbing higher and higher up the tiered road. He had to come to a road that led up into the mountains to a secluded monastery. It was at the very top. You couldn't get there by automobile. Some girl had hung stone beads on it. He didn't understand what kind of gesture it was. So he didn't risk taking it off. Excuse me. Hey, he called out to an old man who was begging on the road. He smelled rotten and seemed to have no hearing. Then Paul yanked him by the shoulder, as if he had come from the other side of the world. He woke up with such a sigh that Paul thought the beggar was choking, but he needed information. He showed the old man the map and poked three times at a certain spot. The beggar pointed forward. Where are you pointing? There's nothing there. Just mountains, Paul snapped at him. But the old man kept pointing into the distance. Paul realized that he was of no use to him and that he would have to look for everything himself. He threw him a few coins. The beggar looked at him as if he were a benefactor and began to nod in gratitude. Paul went on his way. He knew no other way. Forward means forward, and the old man did not deceive him. The monastery could not be seen from the foothills, for the view was blocked by high rocky peaks. After almost a whole day, Paul finally reached the monastery at dusk. A huge white wall framed most of the grounds. The main entrance was through a single massive gate. There was no bell, no push button. Just a door. Paul thought it was wild. However, he knocked on it. To his surprise, the door was quickly opened. A dark-faced old man with a long white beard came out with a torch in his hand. Who is disturbing? He spoke in Indian. Paul had studied the language before this trip and could now explain himself a little. I have come to see the head elder of the monastery. I want to be treated here. I have been looking for a long time. At first the old man looked at the man incredulously. Are you sure you need help? He asked. Yes, very much, Paul answered. He was let inside. The first thing Paul saw was a large garden. Even though it was cold outside the monastery, and there was snow in some places. Flowers were blooming and fruit trees were growing. People in coarse homespun clothes were walking everywhere. Everyone seemed too happy to Paul's eyes, as if drugged. They wandered around the garden, looking at the trees and flowers. And they were really tangibly happy about life. Someone was in a wheelchair, someone limped. One guy had his whole head shaved. Paul assumed he must have cancer. As he looked closer, he realized that no one here was using drugs. All these people were experiencing so-called enlightenment. The provost asked him to wait here. So Paul sat down on a roughly made bench. One of the monks approached him. Who are you? He asked him penetratingly and put his hand on his forehead. Me? No one yet, Paul said thoughtfully. Perhaps these trees, not naturally green in color, had some very calming effect. Everything in this garden seemed to him out of place, mesmerizing. 
It was a very strange feeling. Each one of us is an incarnation of the great Brahma. We are just at the beginning of the path and we have to find ourselves. That's what our teacher says, the monk explained. What else does he tell you? Paul remembered why he had come here when the old man removed his hand from his head, but he was not answered. Another old man approached them and invited them to go into the monastery. They walked along a long corridor for a long time, turning left and right. Finally, the old man stopped at one of the rooms and opened the door. Wait for the teacher here. For now you can help yourself to our tea, the old man explained and left. Paul entered the mysterious room. There was almost no furniture except a low table and two mats lying on the floor. A servant brought tea. Paul drank it, it was delicious. Now he had to act. He did not wait for the teacher to arrive and went back out into the corridor. When he opened the door, he saw halls, cells, something like a dining room, but Eva was nowhere to be found. He almost got caught on the second floor when, opening one of the doors, he saw a number of people in cassocks standing in a circle. If they had seen him, there would have been questions. The answers, to which, of course, he had no answers. Paul stopped in front of each room and listened. Somewhere there was monotonous reading aloud in an unknown language, somewhere it was completely silent. Suddenly Paul heard laughter. The same laughter of his Eva, which could not be confused with anything else in the world. He rushed to the other side of the long corridor, and as soon as he was sure that the laughter was coming from one extreme room, he swung the door open violently. It looked like someone's bedroom was in here. There was just a giant bed, with a translucent canopy over it. But what he saw here horrified him. His breathing became ragged, his hands shook. How could he have agreed to this? To give up his daughter to have something like this done to her. Eva was hanging head down suspended by her feet with some kind of special garter. She looked like a bat as her whole body was wrapped in a cocoon of dense black cloth. There were a couple other people hanging next to her. They looked exactly the same as Eve. And on the bed beneath them were dark blood stains. Paul was shocked at what he saw and was about to go in and stop this outrage, but a heavy, powerful hand fell on his shoulder. He cautiously turned around. In front of him stood the same healer who had taken his daughter from him. Paul's throat went dry. He felt anger, bewilderment, hatred and fear all at once. What are you doing here, honorable one? The teacher asked threateningly. Paul felt like a little boy who had been caught by his teacher. He felt ashamed. But at the same time he felt both anger and incomprehension. What have you done to my daughter? Paul suddenly shouted to himself. She doesn't recognize me. He did not expect himself to react in such a way. The abbot did not answer him, but moved away from the door and gestured for Paul to follow him. The people who came across him bowed low to the hermit. I am listening to your explanations," said this marvelous old man calmly, as he came into the back courtyard. What is going on here? Paul was indignant. I have a right to know. I am her father. What are these barbaric methods? How come there's so much blood? Are you drugging her? No, the teacher shook his head. I ask the questions here, he said calmly and looked at Paul very carefully. It was obvious that he had a terrible restraint to listen to such speeches. My methods must not concern you, he said at last. Everything you have just said is nonsense. Not one word of truth, just lies. You swore to listen to me and not to disturb her privacy. You hung my daughter by her feet, Paul persisted. I don't know how long she's been hanging there. Don't you dare express yourself in a holy place, the monk frowned. No one must see this sacrament. You've already offended God twice. When you drove me away the first time we met, and when you entered this temple. If you care for your daughter, leave this place immediately. I will not leave until I have her. Your services are no longer required. One more word and I'll curse you. Eve's father only laughed in response. But a troubling thought did arise in his soul. Don't joke around. Bring my daughter back at once, Paul begged. I warned you not to interfere, but you have broken the ban. 
From now on you will never be able to see your daughter again. Not even when she is cured, the monk said sadly. Farewell. He turned and left, and Paul was taken away from the monastery by force. I will not leave it like this, he shouted, banging his hands on the high gate. He buttoned up his down jacket and strode back down into the city. He couldn't imagine that they could take his daughter away so easily and do whatever they wanted to her, experiment on her and make her laugh. She probably didn't realize what they were really doing. Poor girl, and she was against the idea from the start. The tramp had clouded Paul's eyes. He should never have agreed to such a dubious proposal, and now Eva had to be summoned from there somehow. Otherwise they'd wear her out. It would be better for her to keep going to school, go to university and live like everyone else. She would have found a way to somehow exist in this life, and Paul had let her down. Her own father had turned her into some dubious institution, and now he regretted it. I'll get you out of there, my girl, Paul said to himself. These words calmed him a little. Suddenly he heard some rumbling. It was something like a distant thunder. Paul did not realize what it was. He realized everything when it was too late. A huge snow avalanche was rolling down from the mountains. He turned around and saw this white, churning mass and realized that everything was over. Fifteen years have passed since then. Eva made a full recovery and was finally able to stand and walk on her own legs. The years of living in the convent had changed her a lot. She was exposed to Indian culture. In her later years, all the pilgrims often went outside the temple boundaries and traveled around the country. When her teacher told her that she was perfectly healthy in body and mind Eva left her home, but she did not want to leave India and decided to settle in one of its cities. Surat is considered to be the most ideal city to live in India. The ecology here is excellent. It's the cleanest city you'll ever find. And what were the sites here? The ancient temples alone were worth it. Here Eve settled down and found her soul mate. He was a European man who had been disabled like her before, but his situation was a little different. His legs had been chopped off while he was working in a factory. He had to have prosthetics, but it didn't interfere with his activities at all. He felt like a full human being. He was very smart and handsome, but that wasn't why Eva loved him. She loved him for his kindness and honesty the way she had been brought up in the convent. She knew a lot about true virtue. Hence responsiveness and openness. Qualities that came first for her. She decided to dedicate her life to helping people and nature. Eva constantly participated in all possible actions and charity events. Honey. I'm leaving, she said and kissed her husband. He also had a rather unusual name, Romeo. Romeo's homeland was the Czech Republic. He was in love with American literature. At university he studied American, and after his injury he became interested in mechanics and eventually became an engineer. He was invited to work in Surat, a technologically developing Indian city. This is where he met the love of his life. Eva and Romeo got married after three years together and were already expecting their firstborn child. Eva worked for a very large conservation and preservation company, and on weekends she taught free reading lessons to poor families. As for her father, Eva didn't remember him at all anymore. The last time they had seen each other had been when she was only seven years old, and she remembered the details of the parting very vaguely, and then the teacher had brought the news that he had been killed in an avalanche. Eva remembered how long it had taken her to get over his death. It had been a real blow to her. She couldn't eat, sleep, study properly. The only family member in her life had died. She had no other relatives, but the monks provided enough support for the girl and that helped. The monastery became her home and its inhabitants her family. Her father's body was never found. Eva had resigned herself to the fact that she couldn't even give her own father a proper burial, and yet he had given her so much. All she had left of her father was a small pendant, a goldfish with emerald eyes. She had kept it all these years and still does. Someday she dreamed of giving it to her own son or daughter. Romeo. I hope you remember that tomorrow we are distributing food? I've already prepared a huge pot of soup, Eva said in a friendly tone, cooking something very tasty on the stove. 
Her husband was working in his office, but he could smell the aromatic odor. Romeo came to the kitchen, hugged and kissed his beloved, and sat down at the table. I remember, darling. His wife put food in his plate and served him to the table. They started to eat, but then the doorbell rang. Did you invite someone? Eve asked Romeo. He shook his head perplexed, then got up and went to open the door. His wife followed him. Good afternoon. A stranger was very respectably dressed, black suit, tie, glasses, perfect hair. Eva had seen such men when she was a child. Daddy's agents often looked like this. Good afternoon. We didn't invite anyone, Romeo answered incredulously. I am the representative of Mr. Paul. Does this name mean anything to you? Continued the stranger. No, Romeo was embarrassed. Yes, yes, Eve interrupted him. It's my father. Then I'm in the right place. We've been looking for you for a long time. We want to inform you that you are your father's heir. Therefore, you need to return to your hometown to sign some documents. Documents? Romeo intervened. What documents? And pardon my indelicacy, who are you to Eva? He's my husband, Eva reassured the agent. Then we'll be waiting for you tomorrow at the airport. Here is the ticket and our business card, the man held out a glossy white card. Tomorrow? Eva shrieked desperately. But tomorrow we are absolutely, busy and. This is a matter of the utmost importance. We've lost too much time looking for you. Your father's business is hanging by a thread. Eva and Romeo looked at each other. All right, I'll be on the first flight out tomorrow, she told the agent. He bowed and left, and the couple was left to ponder. It was urgent to find a volunteer to replace Eva. Hey, Linda. Are you in Surat now? She said to her friend on the phone. Yes. Why are you calling so late? The woman on the other end of the line answered sleepily. Here's the thing. I can't attend an event tomorrow, so help me out. What event? We're giving food to the poor. Remember? I've already made the soup. Just pour it out and give it away. Eva. Well, you know I don't like to do that kind of crap. It's easier for me to put money into it. You want me to find someone? That's what my father used to say. But I made him do it with his own hands, and it helped him a lot, Linda. I want you to do it, not someone else. Please. I really need your help. There was silence on the other end. All right, I'll replace you. Linda said indifferently. But Eva knew she definitely cared. She really wanted to help. What's so urgent? I need to get away. I'll tell you later, she said intriguingly. I found out you got married a year later, and that was by accident. Okay. I have to get my inheritance. To do that I'll have to go to my hometown and do the paperwork. Romeo forbade me to tell anyone about it, so I told you in confidence. You're gonna be a rich auntie now, aren't you? Well, that makes sense. Let me guess. You're gonna donate half your money to charity? Linda. There was laughter on the phone. Okay, I'm kidding. The flight to America was no inconvenience at all. The agent had already bought a business class ticket in advance. Eva looked out the porthole and got sad. She hadn't been here for over 15 years. Here was her past life without legs, with people's slanted glances and complete indifference to people like her. Eva remembered the first time she went to school. After that, the whole adventure of a lifetime happened. She was sad to think of her father. He had given so much of himself to her, and they hadn't even had time to say goodbye properly. Returning to her homeland brought her more than joy. After her flight, she was met by the same agent. He took her to the old house where she had spent her childhood. She stood in the doorway and couldn't step over the threshold, as if there was an invisible wall in front of her, and if she stepped forward, her legs would fail. Of course, it was impossible, but that was how the fear felt. 
She burst into tears in her voice and finally let all her long-held feelings out. All of her worries that she had been saving up for years. The resentment towards her father, the pain of his death. It all came out in tears. Please forgive me, daddy, she cried right on the doorstep. It hurt so much to see this. Her throat began to lump. The memories rolled in like waves. They battered against each other and turned into broken glass. Still, Eva managed to resettle herself and walked into the house. She walked slowly through the rooms. Everything here looked so abandoned, no one had come in here since her father's death. There were even things lying around in her room. Old childhood things that Eva had scattered when she was going on vacation. It was so strange to see. She felt like a ghost walking through the past and peering into the most secret corners of her memory. She picked up the teddy bear from the floor, dusted it off, and she had loved it so much as a child. Why hadn't she taken it with her? She did not proceed to the second floor where her father dwelt. There were strong enough emotions for the day. You never told me about my father, Romeo said into the phone when she called him. Yes. He died when I was eight. I don't remember much about him. All I know is that he wanted the best for me. He didn't always know what to do. What do you mean? He spent money left and right just to please me. He even fired a teacher who couldn't keep up with his class. He was just showing you he loved you. No. He thought money could solve any problem, but it didn't cure my illness. I hope it taught him a lesson. I don't know what to say, though. He did do his best for me. But he didn't always remember that good and evil are boomerangs. It always comes back and can't be bought or redeemed with money. The next day was easier than the last. Eva went to the office to sign some documents. She had panicked a little on the way here, but now she felt quite calm. She took a seat in the chair next to her father's desk and looked around the office. There was mahogany furniture everywhere, and portraits of some people hung around the perimeter of this room. They looked very important. She always thought it was funny that everyone who went to law school could boast a huge portrait of a serious person all over the wall in their office. She even chuckled at her own thoughts. Something made you laugh? The notary looked at the girl incredulously. Uh, no, no. I just sneezed. I'm sorry, Eva smiled. The man signed something in the papers, and after a while he pushed them over to Eva. Please familiarize yourself with the items and then sign right here. Eva looked through the papers carefully. She was indeed inheriting a huge inheritance, business, shares, apartments, cars, some enterprises, factories. There were no questions, and Eva signed the document. At last the matter was over and she could go home. She decided that the question of where to put everything she received she would ask herself later. In India, it was autumn. It was the eve of the Festival of Lights. Eva and Romeo loved the festival. They always decorated their houses, put candles everywhere. Everything looked very romantic and cozy at the same time. The next day they went outside to launch sky lanterns in the evening. According to tradition, they had to bake sweets to distribute to the neighbors and clean the house, which the couple did the day before. Eve wore a beautiful red dress and painted her hands with henna. This holiday symbolized the victory of good over evil. That is why Eva loved it so much. In the evening, the whole town gathered by the lakes, where people launched sky lanterns. It looked very impressive and magical. There were also a lot of tourists here. Who would want to miss such a miracle? The light from the flying lanterns was reflected in the water and the illusion of a huge number of glowing lights was created. Then everyone went to give alms to the poor. Today there was peace, tranquility, peace, love and kindness all over the city. They went through a fair, selling sweets. Eva bought herself some interesting candy, it was very large and looked more like a flatbread. But the saleswoman assured her it was a candy, and it really was. It was orange-flavored, and Eva had loved oranges since she was a little girl. Finally, they noticed an old woman sitting on the grass near the temple. She was blind and held out a change cup. 
Eva put a rather large sum of money in it and set it in her ear. The old woman did not see her, but thanked her very much for such a generous gift. Then they gave alms to a few more needy people and went home, but there was a surprise. On the way they met a beggar, not like the other locals. His appearance was very, very European. Eva took a closer look at him. He was dirty and smelled of rotten fish. Romeo offered to take him home and help the poor guy, since they had no money left. Eva rejected the idea at first, but then agreed. After all, she had always done this, and today, it was all the more relevant. They tried to call out to him, but he didn't seem to understand or hear them. Then Romeo took him on his shoulders and dragged him toward her. The man seemed completely unconcerned, as if he were unconscious. They laid him down in the guest room on a mat. His clothes stank horribly. Yes, and he needed to be washed. But Eva decided that they would do that tomorrow, and tonight they should just get some sleep. So they did. The next morning Eva woke up quite early and went to the kitchen to make coffee. She heard some rustling in the living room and remembered about last night's guest. She woke Romeo, and together they went into the room where the tramp was. He seemed to be very frightened. He was rushing from side to side like a madman. When he saw the couple, he shouted. Who are you? Where am I? Please calm down. We just want to help you, Romeo began, but the stranger didn't listen to him. Bandits. Let me go. He shouted. Man, if you don't calm down now, we'll put you out on the street. You will rot from the filth again, and suffer, Eva said. Romeo was even surprised that she knew how to speak so harshly. Those words really worked on the man. He sat down on the floor and looked at Eva like an exhausted stray dog. First of all, we'll wash you, Eva said, winking at her husband. Be used that's what he'll be doing. Romeo poured the guest a hot bath and when the man looked more or less human, the couple called a doctor. He examined him and said that he had problems with consciousness and memory and needed to be hospitalized. Eva agreed to pay for his treatment. She consulted her husband and he accepted her point of view, though not immediately. The hospitalization required a lot of money, but Eva was convinced that this man really needed help. A month later the girl decided to visit her ward. She came to his room and sat by his bed. She was looking at a man who was already quite healthy. He was completely different from what she saw him a month ago. Well, it's like heaven and earth. Good afternoon. How are you feeling? Eva asked gently. The man turned to her and then decided to sit on the bed so as not to embarrass the girl. After all, he was no longer sick, but resting. Much better. The doctor said I had a brain injury once. So it's very hard to regain my memory. So I can't tell you what happened to me because I can't remember. I'm very glad that you are recovering, Eva smiled. May I ask what your name is? Does it matter? I want to know what kind of angel came down from the sky and gave me this chance. Eva grinned. It was a very clumsy compliment. However, that didn't make it any less sweet. My name is Eva. I wanted to say my name, too, but I don't remember it myself. I still can't understand why you care for me so much. A stranger? You know, I spent my entire childhood in a convent. I had no legs, and our wise teacher said to treat the poor and destitute as if they were your own. Anyone deserves a chance and if I have the opportunity, I will help always. You don't owe me anything. I just have to do good. Because that's when humanity won't become calloused. You're very lucky to have a mentor. You're right. It's too bad my father didn't learn that simple truth, and I ended up an orphan. All I have left of him is a memory. She pulled out a pendant from the slit of her shirt and showed it to the man for some reason. I carry this pendant with me as a sign that anything is possible. I was able to get back on my feet and it wouldn't have happened without my father's help. Eva. The man suddenly shouted, his eyes rounded and his hands shaking. Eva. The woman looked at him with consternation. Was he really crazy after all? And she had so hoped he was cured. 
Oh, my God, Eva. Come on. The man cried and cried. I'm sorry. I don't understand you. She was about to leave, lest something bad happen. Eva. I'm Paul your father, sweetheart. I'm alive. Shouted the stranger. After these words her soul went to the heels. She could see the features of her own father in this face all wrinkled, a terrible scar across his cheek, but all in all it was him. How had she not recognized him as her father right away? Probably her mind had already erased his image from her mind. He was long dead to her. Daddy? She exclaimed, rushing into his arms. Daddy, are you alive? Oh, you? Are you walking now, my girl? She cried from the happiness that was bursting inside her. There was really no limit to this happiness. It turned out that her father had been rescued by one of the local volunteers after the killer avalanche, but he had lost his memory and had been wandering around the cities of India for years. What a coincidence that they happened to be in the same city on the same holiday. Good things boomerang, they always come back. You remember that, don't you? Paul looked at the teacher who had appeared as if out of the void. I remember. I will always remember it now. He replied. So the mysterious India became a second home for both of them, and its ancient monasteries cured the hopelessly sick girl, so that she, in turn, could help people like her father, who had lost hope, sick, stumbled, lost faith in the good.